Are we okay with the streaming, Leo? Cool. Okay, great. Welcome back uh, to this second lecture of COMP 1110, Structured Programming. Um, today we will go a little bit through um, some naming, literals, primitives, and a bunch of things which are on this uh, first slide. Uh, but before doing that, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about some um, uh, admin stuff here. So during the first week, you should have completed your uh, pledge of academic integrity during your, your uh, lab one. And you should have completed also your own uh, lab one. This uh, can, might have been in a lab or in, on your own computer. In general, it would be great if you, essentially you can go through the lab material beforehand. So that would give us, uh, give us uh, the tutors, I mean, the time um, to mark you off without, uh, you know, waiting for you going through through the lab, so that we can streamline the process. Because this year there are very, uh, there is a very large number of students enrolled, um, and our tutors are currently overloaded. Now, due to this uh, tutor overloading, um, which is due to the an excess of students, um, we extended the lab one Markov to week two. So if you have, haven't been able to have your lab one marked off uh, this week, next week tutors uh, will mark off both your lab one and your lab two. One other important um, piece of information is that from starting from next week, uh, you are no more allowed to take any of the labs. For week one, you were allowed to, to go to any of the sessions. From week two, you will have to go uh, to attend the, the, the labs uh, which are scheduled for you, so the ones that you enrolled in. I am also aware of the fact that some of, of you uh, have not been able to enroll in one of the labs. Uh, this is due to the fact that there was uh, a certain number of labs which was um, designed for 485 students. We have 500 for students at the moment. And therefore, what we are doing at the moment is to add an additional um, in-person lab, which will add the space of 60 people. And that will enable people who haven't been able to enroll in one of the labs because they're all booked out to, uh, to enroll. This is an ongoing process. Um, we are waiting the student services to, um, to add that session on my timetable so that you can go and, uh, uh, and, and enroll in, in, in those labs, in that lab. Um, again, if at this stage you have major problems with your schedule, you may contact me. Um, 
with the caveat that um, unfortunately we cannot do much in terms of adding people or swapping people between the labs unless you have already agreed to do so. This is because the um, lab system works um, on my timetable, and this is not just for this course, it is, it is in general throughout the university, uh, on a first come, first serve the basis. So if people have been able to enroll and book into that lab, uh, of course, it would not be fair for them to be kicked out to uh, introduce additional students nor we can add students to those labs because they have a 60 seat limit. So it's a physical limit for the labs. So unless you have agreed with someone else to swap within the labs, uh, uh, I, I, I cannot add you to labs which are uh, already booked out. Another, uh, another thing that happened this week uh, is that, and I understand that, that there are many of you, uh, or at least some of you, sorry, who haven't been able to get uh, the lab one marked off. Again, this is due to the fact that there should be an additional session, which is not yet there in place. So there has been an overload on the tutors. Now, one thing that I would like to recommend is that the tutors are doing really their best to help everybody. Uh, but please contact and talk to the tutors only during the um, allocated lab sessions. That's what they, their job is. Outside of those sessions, they are not, um, uh, th th that's not their job to to, to, to deal with any of the issues with the students. If there are issues outside of that time, you can post them on Piazza. And if there are, you think that these are um, administrative or technical, or, well, I mean, administrative issues which are unresolvable through Piazza, you can email me. Okay, update on Piazza. Um, at this stage, um, I believe I have enrolled all the students in the course in Piazza. If that is not the case, please contact me and I will add you on Piazza. Concerning the, um, the enrollment on our MS Team channel, there is on Piazza, it's one of the reading list posts, uh, it's actually the welcome to structured programming post, there are instructions on how to enroll on our Teams channel. So the process is you're enrolled on Piazza at this stage, and if you haven't been enrolled on the MS Team channel, the instructions are there. You follow those instructions. We will receive a request which will be processed um, as soon as possible, typically within a few hours, and, and then that will add you also to the um, MS Teams uh, channel for the course. Any questions on these at this stage? Oh, I cannot see hands. All right. So let's start a little bit with um, some more interesting content. Um, so during this course, we will be giving uh, um, some short biographies uh, about some of the most eminent uh, computer scientists. This is for for inspirations, uh, inspiration and, and reference. And when we talk about the greatest uh, computer scientists, we, we must absolutely talk about uh, Alan Turing. John von Neumann acknowledged that the central concept of modern computer was due to Turing's papers. So Turing is by far one of the most influential computer scientists. He can be deemed, in fact, the father of theoretical computer science and artificial intelligence. On the theoretical side, Turing invented the so-called Turing machine, which is a very famous piece of work. Um, this machine is a theoretical abstraction of a general purpose computer, and yet uh, anything that is computable by an actual computer today 
is computable by a Turing machine. Um, in fact, Turing is so important that in computer science we don't have a, a, a Nobel Prize. I, I, I think you would be aware of that. But we have uh, the most eminent prize in, in the field of computer science is the Turing Prize. And this year it was uh, awarded to Jack Dongara from the University of Tennessee for his work on uh, linear algebra. Uh, Turing did also an incredibly valuable work in, in cryptography during World War II. Um, he played a key role in breaking the Enigma code, um, which were used uh, by the Germany for their radio communications. And, and there was a pivotal moment uh, in, in deciding the outcomes of World War II. Uh, Turing believed that, that computers eventually would be capable of processes which are indistinguishable from that uh, of a human thought. Uh, and he proposed a simple test known as uh, the Turing test uh, to test their capability. Uh, in fact, today we are beyond the Turing test, so our in artificial intelligence algorithms are already able to crack uh, a Turing test for most cases. So we, we, are, we have most, more advanced tests to, 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 to check on the accuracy um, and sophistication of artificial intelligence. Turing had a very mysterious um, end of when he was around 41. Uh, he was homosexual and unfortunately at that time this was illegal uh, in, in England. And he was found uh, uh, dead in his bed uh, poisoned by cyanide in mysterious circumstances. All we know is that um, essentially the, uh, the, the, the British government arrested him because he was homosexual, uh, which was a terrible thing to do, uh, and sentenced him to uh, 12 months of hormone therapy and then um, this mysterious uh, death, death happened. The British government apologized for what uh, this, this, this terrible um, situation in which they put um, Alan Turing through. Okay, Java 3. So let's get back a little bit in our Java mode um, and let's discuss packages. So last week we have already seen a little bit of packages. When I was creating the folders within IntelliJ, I was saying these are actually packages. Um, and so what packages do is to give us some uh, context or actually to give classes and methods which are defined within a package a certain, a certain context. Um, so by putting a class inside the package, uh, other people can use the same name for a class, for example, um, in another package and those names will not conflict. And here is an example. Uh, let's say we have our class that we are talking about, uh, which is called Mary. Uh, the question here is which Mary we are talking about. There may be many Marys here. And then uh, the attribute, uh, or, or I should say the name, uh, Queen of the Scots, um, um, or the specification Queen of the Scots provides a namespace so, we, so that we can identify which Mary uh, which would be a class, for example, in our case, um, in an unambiguous way. And so in Java, uh, uh, again, the packages um, can be also identified by using that the specific package keyword. Modules. Um, a Java module is a group, or you can think of it as a group the name of packages and related resources. So this, these are higher level uh, grouping of uh, namespaces and functionalities uh, than packages. You won't have much interaction with, uh, with modules. Uh, there will be a little bit of interaction with uh, the JavaFX modules, uh, which you will be using uh, because JavaFX uh, provides graphical user interface uh, functionalities that are in your assignment. So um, what does a module do? Um, well, it contains a number of packages, as I said, uh, and additional resources and files. It has a strong encapsulation. 
uh, this means that um, you have you must explicitly state which packages inside the module uh, you want the outside world to see. And this is encoded through these exports uh, keyword. So whatever package you export from within the module, those are the packages that the outside world uh, or the code outside the module is going to be able to, to see and to use. The other packages are kept hidden. Um, it has explicit dependencies, uh, which are encoded through these requires uh, keyword. Um, and the transitive here means that if any other module makes use of this module, it will inherit the dependencies of, of this, uh, it will inherit the specific dependencies of this module. And here instead of the uses uh, a keyword or directive um, specifies a class uh, that implements uh, some functionalities which are used within that module. Okay, um, what kind of variables uh, can we find uh, in, in Java? And I have to say this is actually goes a little bit beyond Java to a certain extent. It's a, it's a very similar classification of variables in other structured and object-oriented programming um, uh, languages. Um, the first kind of variable that you can find is an instance variable. So last time I mentioned that a class is a blueprint for objects. And when we create an object of a certain class, we have created an instance, which is a synonym of an object, of that class. So we have instantiated an object. Now, clearly, why would you create an instance of an object, uh, more than one instance of an object? Well, the reason is typically each instance has different values for their own data fields, right? And so what that means is that, that those variables are specific to that particular instance of that class or to that particular uh, object. And these are called uh, instance variables essentially are the data fields which are specific to an object. Um, <clears throat> so you can also have um, uh, data fields uh, which are instead specific to the class and not to the object. Um, and uh, so these, these, um, these variables can be defined by using the, uh, the static uh, uh, keyword and um, this will define one variable one variable for the class. So all instances of that class will all refer to a single variable uh, of that particular um, uh, uh, class. Uh, these are also called the global variables for obvious reasons, right? Because they, they, they are global. Uh, there are also reasons of, of, of where they are stored in memory there, which I won't get uh, into. But essentially, the reason is that they are global for all, um, for all objects of that class. Uh, then there are local variables. Um, so these are not the data fields. Whenever you create a method or add a method to a class, typically that method does some calculation and stuff like this, some intermediates in, in its own definition, so in its own implementation. And typically in that implementation, you have some temporary variables uh, or variables which we call local variables because their existence is tied only to that particular scope. And which brings me to the concept of scope. What is, what is the scope of, of a code? In this particular case, you can think of the scope and actually the scope is just the code which is between two braces. So whenever you define a method, you, you must have seen that there are braces enclosing the code. That defines a scope where local variables are initialized, used, and then deallocated. Uh, and then there are parameters. Uh, the parameters, again, they have a temporary state, which is limited to the execution scope. These are typically the, um, well, typically they are the variables that you pass to your methods. And uh, in, in practice, when, when you see your method, your method might not take any parameter. But when it takes parameters, 
um, that, uh, that string that defines all the parameters is actually called the method signature. So the parameters are there, um, the variables which, are, which, which together um, uh, compose the, uh, the, the method signature. Okay, naming, uh, some naming conventions uh, and rules that we have to discuss in Java. Uh, well, first of all, names are uh, case sensitive. Another important thing is that white space is not permitted. What that means is if you're trying to define a variable and you use two words and put the space in the middle, that is not, not legal syntax in Java and in many other languages. There are some symbols uh, that you must avoid when you are defining names for your variables, um, such as the dollar sign or the underscore, which makes actually Java quite different from, or, or a little bit unusual, I, I should say, in terms of object-oriented programming languages. For example, the underscore is quite used in C or C++ as, uh, as a separator between the words uh, to define a single variable, but not in Java. Um, you cannot start a name also, which is not here, with a numeric value, again, common across many, many other languages. Uh, there are several reserved names that you cannot use. Um, the most obvious one is class with a capital C. Those are words which are used for specific functionalities within the language. Uh, Java programmers use some specific uh, capitalization conventions. Uh, here are uh, some of the rules that they use. Um, the class names always start with the capital letters, as you can see here, bike with the capital B. And then uh, the variable names start with the lowercase, and they use uppercase for the subsequent words. This is called the camel case uh, uh, convention. Um, again, quite different from C or C++, for example. And then constant uh, constants uh, uh, typically use all caps and only for constants we are allowed to use underscores to separate the words. So why, why do you think it, it, it's actually important to have naming conventions uh, in, in software development and in programming languages? Anybody? Yes? Right, so one important reason is definitely readability, right? Because uh, sticking to the convention makes, us, makes our code more readable. Another reason is that, uh, I guess this is perhaps, it depends how you interpret readability itself, but it could be absorbed into the readability category is to uh, immediately understand what is the definition of a class? What is a variable in your code? What is a method? And this helps uh, a lot when you are trying to study a code which is not your own. So please uh, stick to the conventions. Uh, they are very important uh, for software development and, uh, and for making, ultimately for making your life and others, other developers' life much, much easier and better. Okay, so in, in the la during the last lecture, I said that almost everything in Java is an object. And if I said almost, that means there are exceptions. These exceptions uh, are primitive data types. Um, so these are data types which are built in, uh, and all of them, they are shown in this table. Um, what is a primitive data type? Um, well, this goes back to what I mentioned last lecture about integers. Um, and you can see here that int is one of the primitive data types. Uh, primitive data types essentially define uh, a bitwise representation for data together uh, with that, the specific rules on how the data is manipulated during the operations which are specific to that data type, which can be, for example, arithmetic operations, for example. And the, the main reason for having uh, primitive data types is performance. Uh, so having an object comes with 
uh, a significant uh, uh, overhead, especially when you are, uh, uh, if, if you're using objects or creating objects in the most uh, performance critical parts of your code. Uh, and so if you're doing a lot of computation and you have a critical part of your code, then you can simplify that by using a specific data format that you know that it works well for that, then uh, primitive data types are what you need to use. They will streamline the development, but on top of that, they will, they will give you more, uh, better performance. Um, most of these uh, types in Java have also an object representation. And what the way you obtain the object representation, again, that will be an object to do. So th th that means that there is a class. There is a corresponding class to these primitive data types. And the way you obtain that is just by using the Java conventions. So you can capitalize the, the word, the first letter, and you will obtain the corresponding class. Those classes are useful because they provide the methods uh, to manipulate additional methods to manipulate um, these, uh, these primitive data types or to convert between uh, types or to initialize them. So there are a bunch of additional uh, nice methods that you can use in those classes. Um, what's the key thing about uh, one of the key features of primitive data types? As you can see there, they all have different sizes in bits. Uh, byte is 8-bit, short is 16. The typical normal integer representation is, is 32. There is also a representation which is a long integer, long, uh, which, which uh, is encoded using 64 bits. That allows for dealing with much larger numbers. And then we have these um, uh, floating point numbers. And they come in two formats, float and double. So these are the way we try to represent real numbers on a machine, on a computer. But here you need to be very careful because real numbers um, span, uh, 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 have an infinite span, right? So there is an infinite number of real numbers while there is a finite number of floating point numbers that you can represent on a machine. So floating point numbers have have quite different properties of, in, in some senses from real numbers. Although they, they look similar internally, uh, they're just a discrete representation. Uh, then uh, again, uh, well, the single and double is just for enabling a, a larger spectrum of numbers. So double is 64 bit, so you can have more numbers. Uh, Boolean, just a single bit, one or zero, true or false. And another thing that I want to say is about char. Uh, so the, the chars, uh, which stands for characters, they have a 16-bit encoding and they're Unicode characters, but, but um, under the hood, these things are encoded as numbers. So if you add the two chars, it's not going to do a string concatenation. It's going to add the two underlying numbers and give you another character which corresponds to that, uh, to that number. So be careful with that. Uh, Java literals, um, so when, when you write um, <clears throat> in your code uh, a numerical value such as one, we, we saw an example uh, last, uh, during the last session, int i equals one or int i equals zero. That zero, that one is a literal and is a, is a character that uh, the compiler recognizes automatically as a, as a legal value for example, for an integer. Uh, and there are many of these literals um, that you can use as legal value for initialization of integers uh, or, or, or of, um, of chars. And of course, we have seen also literals for the strings, where you put in the quotes, uh, your string. That is a literal, and you can initialize a string with that. And there are some uh, additional uh, kind of fine-tuning features that you can add when you have these literals. If you want uh, that your integer value is a long one, you can add the trailing um, L or capital L to your number that will make it a long representation. Uh, this is something to be careful with. The prefix 0x means that you are using an hexadecimal representation, and the 0b means that you're using a binary representation. 
So 0x30 is actually in the decimal representation corresponds to the number 48. Why? Because this is 0 times 16 uh, plus 3 times 16, which is 48. And then the same you can do for, uh, for, um, for the binary there. One other thing to be careful with um, is that if you add the 0 before your number, it will la that actually means that you're using an octal representation. So be careful, do not add zeros before your numbers because that means that, that can be a source of bags which are, which is, which are quite difficult to find. Um, okay, we can postfix uh, an F or a D to indicate that the number is a, is a single precision floating point number uh, here called the float or a, a double precision floating point number D. And then uh, you can use for clarity and readability underscores to separate your numbers. Especially for integers, big ones, that it's quite useful. All right, this takes us to the first mini quiz that I'm going now to release. Publish the poll for a class variable. Each object has its own version instance of the field. It is a temporary state limited to execution scope of code. It is temporary state limited to execution scope passed from one method to another. Exactly one version of the field exists. In the meantime, that you take this poll, I will set up the code because we are going also to do uh, 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 one of our live coding sessions. Is this okay? Can, can, can anybody see the code? Is, is, is this better? The, the, the font is larger than last time, and I hope you can read everything. Otherwise, I can pull it a little bit down. Let's see. Is it even better if I do this? Yes? Sorry, in which mode? Oh, okay, let's see. Uh, is it in appearance? Mm -mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another thing that I was thinking. I'm not sure. Here? Okay, cool. It's it's one of the teams or okay. Light, you mean? Religion light. Let's see what happens. Uh, better? Better for everybody? Yes? Cool. Great. All right. Thanks for that. Um, what are we going to do here? Okay, so this is the stuff that we created uh, last, uh, uh, during the last session. Now I'm going to create a new, uh, a new package in here 
uh, called uh, Java 3. JO3. And the min function, and we are going to discuss a little bit about these primitive data types, just basic stuff. So let's start with booleans. Let's add this to our GitHub and let's add our main function again. As I said last week, we need to create an entry point for the execution of our code. So what can we do with booleans? Well, as I just mentioned, this is a single bit encoding. So it's just one or zero. So we can write our boolean this way and then say A is true. Uh, and then, of course, we can print that as we've done last last time. Say a is this value, and then of course the other value that we can attribute to it. Um, and let's create another another variable for that. It's a false. Now, one thing to notice here is that um, we are not using any capitalization. Uh, for uh, for the the values that the boolean can take, and this is uh, this is different from other languages where, for example, the first um, the first letter might be capitalized. Now, what I want to show you is the, that um, there are some um, useful methods that you can access when you use the corresponding uh, uh, class. Uh, the, the class corresponding to one of these types. For example, let's see. Let's say that I'm going to create a string. Let's call it C, and let's say we set this to true. Now, this is just a string, and actually, the one on the right hand side of that of, of that the equal sign that is a literal. Um, and then what we can do is to initialize a boolean. Uh, by using that string, by converting the string into a boolean, if 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 that string makes a sense for the method that I'm going to show you now. So let's say C is, and then we can use the corresponding class, uh, which is called boolean. C is just capitalized, and then you can access. Um, and IntelliJ is very smart; it's already understood. That what I want to do is to pass a string. So take that string, convert it into a boolean, um, and so I can provide it in here. And then we'll, we'll, what we'll do is convert the string into a boolean, and then for some mechanism that we will study in the next few uh, um, lectures, then that is converted in turn into a string which is concatenated with the first string there. So let's try this out. It's a bit too big, and uh, well, I guess I should have put some space here. Okay, quickly, let's go now to do some um, doubles, floating point numbers. Just this is just initial stuff for letting you understand uh, what are we talking about here. And once again, uh, we use our main function. I will not repeat this anymore. And the double, as I said before, it's the, the closest thing that you can think of is a real number. So something like 1 point whatever, 34, right? And again, printing works the same way. So let's see what, what it prints, that, prints out here. Plus goes there. <clears throat> now, uh, one thing that I said before is that floating point numbers are not real numbers. And well, from this, you can't really see it. So let's say instead that we uh, take, uh, initialize our double, again, I don't need to redefine things here, to one third. So I take one, 
and uh, I divided by divided by three. And as you know, uh, this is uh, this is a real number with an infinite representation. This is going to be zero point three 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 forever. And let's see what this prints out. What's 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 actually how is this going to be represented um, as as a floating point number? Let's run this. All right. So, as you can see, of course, uh, this this is a terminating uh, sequence of zero point three. Uh, so, as a terminate, why why is that? What, why do you think we have this terminating sequence? What is going on there? Clearly, this is this does not equal. I, I want you to realize that this does not equal to one third, right? Because uh, in order to equal to one third, it would needed to be an infinite string of trees in there. So, so what's going on here? Any ideas? Yes. Sorry. Right, so a double is only 64 bits, so we, we just ran out of bits there. We do the, we, the, the representation does the best that it can uh, to get very, very close to that value, but it can't actually represent it exactly. And, and this is a big issue, right? So that's, that's where we can't, there is not a one-to-one -one mapping between real numbers and floating point numbers. Sometimes real numbers can be represented exactly as, as, as floating point numbers, but in many other cases, they can't. Okay, the other thing is, uh, once again, here we can use um, our um, um, corresponding class uh, to do things, so to parse the double, for example, uh, analogously to what we have done before. Um, so let's say we use this class, and then we do parse double, and then we can initialize this directly with a string, um, 3.56, that's one thing that we can do. The other one that I want to show you is that uh, floating point uh, numbers um, can be also, they have a particular representation for the string, for the literals that they accept, which is very similar to scientific notation. Uh, for example, I could write D equals 1.75 e plus 4. Um, does anybody know what that means? One seventy five. No, it's not directly the power of 4. What's implicitly saying is 175 times 10 to the power of 4. Okay, and so I'll show you the result here. And you can do it also with minus. So it's the number times 10. So you could replace, if you want, e with, in your mind, with times 10 elevated to the power of whatever comes next. So let's print this out so this is clear. Last value. Keyboard is doing some strange stuff. Of D. Okay, and we can print this out to just um, so that you understand precisely what I mean there. That is quite handy, um, and it's it, it's very much used. Okay, next one, very very quickly, um, uh, integers. We already done integers. Just reminding you. Um, a little bit so that concepts stick with you. And let's add the main function quickly. And so we, we have already done this int a equals zero. We're using a literal to initialize that day. 
Another thing that we can do is to use our underscore representation to separate um, for, 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 for tidiness, really, um, our numbers. That will do. Um, and then the other thing, again, I can define another integer and say integer showing the same functionality essentially as before for other types, um, 132. I can initialize it with a string this way. Um, and we have seen all of these things. Um, I mean, let's just print it out. Um, a and B here. A is A and then And let's run this. And then uh, let's do one example with strings, which are would be very helpful uh, in your um, assignment. Strings. Let's add this. And there. We have seen before that we, the string is an object. Uh, this means that it has various uh, initial ways you can initialize it. Uh, one way which we have, I believe have, we have seen, is just by using a literal. In that it seems so similar to a primitive data type, but that it's not. Uh, another way is to initialize it uh, by using something which is the constructor. We will, we will actually talk this lecture about this. So that is another initialization. And you can put a string in there, or you can put even nothing, because there will be a default value uh, for initializing it. Um, so that is a legal syntax. Um, and then, again, let's do string uh, c, to just to remind people that, let's say, um, Space world. Um, you can concatenate these things by using the plus operation. Uh, so the addition. So another string, for example, could be uh, well. Actually, let's use y in this case. Equals uh, x plus z. That plus is not arithmetic addition. Is concatenation. So let's print it. I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, why? All right. Uh, any questions on this? Um, very simple examples here. Trying to find my way back to the slides. Nope. OK, then uh, back to the slides. We've done our mini quits. Java 4. OK, things get a little bit more exciting. Um, arrays, operators, expression statements, blocks, and random which is kind of a, you will see it's a class that we define because it, it tends to be helpful in the assignment. Okay, so what are arrays? Um, arrays are a way uh, of storing sequences of data. And the sequence of data that you store have to be all of the same type. And that type can be a primitive data type or it can be a, 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 a given class. The important thing is that they're homogeneous, right? So you can have arrays, arrays of objects, but those objects need to be all of the same class. Um, the, uh, um, the way we declare an array in, uh, well, no, one thing to note, this is not a primitive data type as well. It's, um, it's, um, uh, it's actually an object. Um, but it has its own special syntax. So this is kind of a special kind of object. Uh, in particular, we declare arrays by using the primitive data type, uh, or the type actually could be a class, uh, a type, uh, a type associated with a class, 
and then uh, these uh, square braces notation followed, uh, following the type, and then the name of the variable. Now, for that particular, um, when we use that notation and we write that statement, all we are doing is actually declaring uh, that, that variable. What does that mean? Well, that means that it's telling the compiler, I will be using an array. Um, you need to allocate some memory, but that memory is not for the whole array because it can't be, right? We haven't, we haven't, we haven't told it how many elements that, that array should have, right? So it cannot allocate that, that amount of memory. What it does is just to allocate the reference, so some space in memory that will refer to the place uh, that will be used to store a variable that refers to the place in memory where we will be putting the array, okay? Actually, to the first location. This is called the reference. So at that point, it's just allocating space for a reference to that array. And then uh, this is the initialization. This is done through the usage of this new operator um, and with this notation, so the type, then again the braces, uh, the sorry, square brackets, and the number of elements that we want. At that point, what is happening is that the 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 the, the runtime uh, or the compiler depends how this is done. But essentially, this is a dynamic allocation. So a runtime, we will be allocating memory, and this will be on the stack. Uh, sorry, on the heap. Um, a special kind of memory to, um, to, to store eight integers, one after the other. What also happens there is that um, I will be linking the reference of the space that I had before uh, for the reference. I will be putting in there the address of the first one of those integers in memory. You don't need to know the, all these details, but if you're curious, I'm just explaining them. What's important is, is allocating the memory. Uh, it's linking the reference, but it's also doing another thing. It's in, in Java, whenever you use a new, is um, initializing those, uh, those values. Uh, this is a bit atypical. Uh, other languages like C++ don't do this. So the only thing that the new will do in C++ is to allocate the memory and then it will leave all the values uninitialized. While in Java, they are initialized to the default value of that specific type. For an, for an integer, for example, is zero. Then you can access them by using this notation here. So what this means is that I'm, I'm accessing the third, uh, sorry, actually the fourth element uh, of that uh, array. Uh, this is because Java, as C, uses a zero-based uh, uh, zero um, indexing um, uh, notation. Uh, so if you're familiar with um, Julia, for example, or with Fortran, they, those languages use a one-index-based uh, um, notation or, or one-based indexing. Uh, but in this case, your first um, index will always be a zero, not a one. So that, that three means if I'm accessing the fourth element. Uh, here there is just a, a, a useful function, and there's plenty of them. It's just to show you that in the standard library, there are functions that can do things for you and, and so that you don't really have to code them up. But these are, tend to be very efficient functions for, for um, uh, or I guess I should call it the method of the system class uh, for... Um, uh, for some functionalities which are very commonly used. Um, and in this case, uh, what this um, uh, method is doing is copying uh, a certain uh, uh, um, number of elements from uh, array X to array Y. So the first one we are copying from it, we are copying from X, we are copying into Y, and then in X, we are copying from location zero, and in Y, we are copying to, the first index we are copying it into is zero, and we are copying uh, at eight elements. That, that's what this means. All right, next one, operators. Um, clearly, operators are very important. There, there are very different kinds, of various different kinds of operators in Java. 
the, 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 the meaning, one of the things that I want to stress is that Java is very much object oriented and object based. Uh, and the meaning of operators depends on the objects they are operating on. Uh, it, in fact, you can have, uh, and you will see examples of this, uh, the so-called operator overloading. So if I write a class, I can overload uh, or I can define or overload the meaning of an operator to mean something special, some kind of operation that I want to do within that specific class. We have seen this for strings. Plus doesn't mean addition, it, is, it means string concatenation. So the meaning of that operator depends on the object is operating on. This being said, uh, the equal operator is used for assignment, uh, so to assign v values to variables, um, or uh, in general, this can be variables uh, coming from uh, an object or a primitive data type. Um, and then we have a bunch of arithmetic operators, um, plus, minus, times, multiplication, division, and uh, that percent means uh, that is a modulo operator uh, what that does is to perform a division and then uh, return the remainder of that division. And that is tends to be extremely um, helpful when we are dealing with integers and in many algorithms. Uh, but also on top of that, the reason why it's there is it can be implemented very fast um, on, on CPUs. Now, these are all binary operators. What, what that means is that in order to use them, you use two operands, right? You do A plus B. A and B are the operands, and plus is the operator. Um, before I go to, this, uh, to the compound ones uh, there, the plus equal plus minus, I will go below, because we talked about binary operators. The one below are unary operators. And you can see that the plus is both, and the minus as well, a, a binary or, or, or a unary operator. What does, uh, what does plus do as a, as, a, um, as a unary operator? Well, essentially nothing. Uh, it's just um, if you have an integer that is saying, OK, I am assigning the sign. Um, um, uh, I am not doing anything to this integer. Uh, whenever you have a variable, and you write a plus x, um, what it's doing is returning essentially x, right? The minus one instead is changing the sign. So you're taking the negative of that um, uh, variable, whatever that means. If it is a number, it's the negative of the number. The ones which are more interesting are the uh, uh, unary increment and decrement operators, the plus plus and, and minus minus. What those two is to increment your variable by one unit. And that depends also on which kind of uh, object or type you are using it on. But again, for the sake of simplicity, integers. So if I do plus plus i and the value of i was 0, then it will return a 1. These operators can be used as a prefix or a postfix. Uh, so you can have a prefix increment and a postfix increment. I will just tell you that basically the difference between the two is that what they return. They both will increment by one unit of that variable, but the, the, the prefix will increment will return the result uh, of this increment, while the postfix will return the original variable. Um, then the ex exclamation bar mark there is just a negation operator. So it's a logical negation. Now we can go back a little bit to the ones above, the plus equal, minus equal, times equal, and so on. And they will do pretty much the same thing. But um, what I want to point out is that plus equal is essentially equivalent to the unary plus plus. Because what you do is it's a binary operator, right? So I could say a, um, or it's very similar, sorry, I should say, to the unary uh, plus plus. It's a bit more flexible. What you do is, to, you, if you write a plus equal 2, or a, actually let's do a plus equal 1, that will increment a by a factor of 1. Whereas it is more flexible than unary plus plus is that they can put anything on the right-hand side, right? So I could say a plus equal 2, 
and that will increment A by two units and not one. Then we have equality, relational, a bunch of logical operators, to be fair. Um, the equals, equals uh, it, it's the logical testing for logical equality. This is a binary operator, so A equals equals um, B. Is asking the question, is A equal to B? Uh, uh, exclamation mark equal, it's not equal. So again, that would say, is A not equal to B? And then we have greater, greater than uh, and equal to, uh, lesser and lesser than. And then the 2 percent there, they are the logical end. And the two bars are the logical or. And then we have this thing which is instance of. Instance of uh, is simply uh, testing whether a variable uh, is of a certain type. And that type can be primitive data type or can be a class. Finally, we have the bitwise operators. I will not go too much into this, but essentially what these things do is to operate on your variables uh, at the bit level representation. Um, for example, the tilde there is the uh, bitwise um, negation. So if I have a, a string of all ones and that's the way at the bit level that my number is represented, it will turn them all in zeros. That's a negation on the bits. Uh, the ampersand is the is the bitwise end. This uh, this other symbol there is the third is the um, exclusive or. Uh, then we have or, and then we have these other three which are bit shifts. What these things do is the left um, um, the binary left shift. Uh, what it does is to shift the bits within your variable and by a certain amount, it's a binary operator. So you can say how, how many bits I want to shift to the left or to the right in my variable. And then there is this special one, which is the unsigned right bit shift, which is a, just a slightly different from the normal bit shift. We won't be using that. Okay, expressions. Um, so, the notion of expression is essentially a construct or a piece of code uh, that evaluates to a single value. Now, this, this, therefore the expressions can be made up of uh, a mix of different things, um, or different entities, variables, um, operators, method invocations, you can put all of them together. As long as it returns a value, that is, a, that is an expression. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is that um, when I say single value, that value might be nothing. Uh, we have seen this, um, although, I mean, just a little bit, um, but I can, uh, let's say, point you to the fact that an example is in your main function that we just used. Um, that main function has a return type which is called void. What that means is that, the, uh, sorry, the method, I should say, the main method has a return type which is void, and that means that is returning nothing, okay? That still, still is, it's legally uh, a, a construct. Uh, then we have compound expressions. Okay, so what's interesting about compound expressions is you can ask the question, if I have a bunch of variables and I'm adding them, I'm multiplying them, I'm doing all sorts of operations to them, um, and these variables can be object, objects, primitive data types, um, how is this, um, uh, the compiler or the runtime going to evaluate this expression, right? What, what is the order? And the order is defined by a so-called operator precedence list. So you can find in the Java manuals and so on and online um, how the expressions have precedences. And I have an example here. So the default precedence uh, for, uh, uh, for the plus and multiplication operator is that the multiplication is evaluated first. So in that expression there, uh, A plus B times C what will happen is that B times C is evaluated first. That gives rise to a value, which is whatever that is, the multiplication. 
and then the addition between A and the result of B times C is, is executed. And of course, you need to be careful with this because this means that, that there, there is a certain syntax for meaning some specific uh, operations and combinations of variables. You can override the um, uh, operator precedence rules uh, by using parentheses. So that's the same example there. Um, if I wanted to do A plus B first, then I would just put parentheses around them. And in that case, A plus B will be evaluated first, and then will the, res the resulting value will be multiplied by C. Statements. Um, all right, so this is essentially, uh, you put a semicolon at the end of an ex expression, and that will give you um, an expression statement. This is essentially a, 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 a single or a complete unit of execution. Um, and we have seen some examples of these already. You can have assignment expressions when you're assigned a vari variable. You, you can have an expression just by using the unary increment or decrement operators. Plus, plus, i, semicolon. That is an expression is going to increment i. Uh, method invocations, uh, uh, object creation expressions, um, initialization or creation, calls of um, constructors that we'll talk about later. Declaration statements is where I am not initializing my variable, int i, semicolon, right? You're just declaring, and I said before, as for arrays, typically what this does is to allocate memory without any initialization, so some space for that variable. And the amount of space depends on the type or, or the object. And then we will have control flow statements, which we'll see uh, next, next week. <clears throat> Blocks, um, I kind of um, mentioned this before. Um, these are zero more statements that are balanced by braces. And you have found these in our main method, for example, or they are also, when you define a class, um, uh, those define a block of code. You can put them pretty much anywhere. Um, uh, you know, you can put them around a single statement. Uh, what that also does is to define a local scope, uh, although we won't be using this functionality, but in practice, what it does, typically when you find the braces in um, um, something which is not um, you know, the, your method definition or your class definition is trying to define a local scope so that the variables, the local variables, which, the variables which are defined within that block, they are local to that scope. Okay, and this is a bit of a random thing, um, but not quite random because this is helpful for the assignment. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this random class. Uh, so the random class um, provides something called uh, a pseudo-random number generator. Um, does anybody know what that means? What's a pseudo-random number generator? Yes? Exactly. That's, that's, that's pretty much a good enough definition. Yes. So in computer science, well, I should, I should be very careful here because I will say where the exception is. Um, we don't really have random numbers. Um, what we have uh, are sequences of numbers which have very similar properties uh, to, um, well, the main properties of interest, to be fair, uh, of random numbers. But they're not really random. So they are generated mathematically as sequences. So through randomness, used not to exist until a few, very few years ago uh, when we started having quantum computers because QPUs, quantum processing units, instead can generate true random numbers. Anyway, these are not true random numbers. Um, so what you can do with this is we want to have to generate some random numbers, right? And there's this class called the random. We initialize it, um, we do new random that we'll call a constructor, which we'll talk about, but we have seen the initialization here. And then once you have, uh, once you have initialized it, uh, it, 
you can use methods in that cluster to generate these numbers. Now, what is important is, uh, is why I mentioned the pseudo-random number thing. The reason is that you can provide a seed to, this, uh, to initialize your random object, um, which is an object of the random class, uh, not uh, uh, any object in the world. Um, and for that one, um, the seed guarantees that the sequence of random numbers which will be generated is deterministic. So if you have two objects which, uh, of the random class which are initialized with the same seed, they will produce the same random numbers. Okay? And then, well, there is this example here where, uh, you know, once you have one of these objects, you can call some methods, in this case it's next int, put an upper bound on uh, uh, the kind of, uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the magnitude of the random number that you want to generate. In this case, it will generate a, number, a random number between 0 and 9. Okay, another mini quiz. Let's release it, the last for today. Publish the poll. And this is about Java blocks. What's a Java block? All right, in the meantime, switching to coding mode, I'll give you another 30 seconds to answer the question. Oh, and by the way, these polls, um, I guess it, it's great if you can take them during, during the sessions, although they will be open for a limited amount of time um, during the week in which they are released, not after that. Okay, so let's create another package. And we are going to call it Java 4. And in this Java 4 package, we are going to create a new class and we are going to talk about arrays, which are very useful. Okay, let's create a main function, main method. Oh, by the way, sorry. If I say function in Java, that is uh, really a method. Um, I guess I am I'm misusing uh, the, 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 the term, in practice, in Java, there are no functions. There are only methods. While in other languages, there are both functions and, method, and methods. But here is the same thing. OK, so let's declare um, an array of doubles. So this double, uh, um, double precision floating point numbers um, I need to put um, these braces here to declare it. As I said before, um, this is just a declaration stage. Where what we are doing here is to allocate space uh, in memory only for the reference to that array. And then uh, we initialize it this way by using the new operator. And let's say, we, you know, I want to have an array with four doubles in there. Oops. Initialization. Or also called instantiation, because this is an object. There 
is an ender. <clears throat> okay, so at that, at that stage, uh, we would have um, linked to the reference, we will have allocated the memory, we will have initialized um, these, these, these array elements. So, uh, so let's print it out. So what do you think will happen if I do this? If I try to print that out? Any ideas? Yes? Right, you went a little bit beyond. Uh, yes, it, it, in Java it actually prints out the reference and also the type uh, of some, some reference to the type of that particular array. Um, but for the sake of pretty much everybody, I mean, if you understand that, that is fine. That goes a bit beyond and is correct. Um, but goes a, a little bit beyond. It will print this gobbledygook here, <laughs> um, which is some kind of um, indication information in reality about the type uh, of the elements, the data type and that array, and then it's it's uh, it's it's actually the reference. Uh, well, it's it's actually the address of the reference that will be used. So it's a little bit more complicated. You don't need to know that. Uh, the point is, it's not going to print out the elements of our array, and that is because there is no built-in function that nicely prints out um, the elements of that array. So if you want to print them out, you've got to go one by one. And let's say do this. Uh, let's comment this out. We don't need it. A zero. That will be the first element. And then can have a bunch of them. One, two, and three. And let's run this. And now we wrote five, right? So we're printing element wise. And as I said before, because we used new, this is all initialized to the full to the default value of of a double, which is zero. Um, naturally, once we have the array, this is this each element of the array operates as its own variable. So, as for the integers, as in general in, in imperative programming, you can reuse that. So, for example, I could say a one. Now I'm accessing that, but at the same time, I can assign to the second element of that array the value that I want. So, let's say one point four. Um, and that will assign the, will assign it um, to to a one, and they can check that of course. Let's do it, and they will do that. Now um, another couple of quick things about this. Uh, clearly, uh, you can put declaration and initialization on the same line. That's actually typically what you do. Uh, so you can do double, then b, and then new, double, and it could be whatever. We have six elements in there. That's that's a legal notation. It's, a, it's actually the most used one. There is a third one which is quite helpful, and this is a notation that uses uh, 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 an initializer list. So. Let's use an integer just to change a little bit things. And let's call this integer i. This is an array. Um, then what I can do is to use new, this notation, new int. I'm not going to put the number of elements in the square uh, brackets, but I'm going to give it directly a list of the elements that I want, uh, or the values for the elements that I want to be in there. So something like this, oops, something like this. Right, and that's again legal syntax. What that is going to do, the compiler looks at the list, looks at the length of the list, and knows that there are three elements in that array, and so allocates the memory for three of them, and at the same time initializes them by using the values in the initializer list. The initializer list is the thing 
in the in the in the braces. Um, one last thing to point out, I want to do a little, go a little bit quickly because we don't have more than another 10 minutes, um, is that um, uh, the common convention for, uh, for declaring uh, an array is this, right? Uh, well, it's complaining about A because I, I, I used it. Um, but um, in <laughs> somehow... Um, unfortunately, I should say, you can also declare an array like this. And my point is, don't do it. Uh, because uh, this is the way we declare arrays in, uh, in Java. This is a residual of a C notation um, that uh, is, has nothing to do with Java. It's, it is legal, uh, I, I think. Uh, it shouldn't be um, stick with, with, uh, with the traditional one. Okay, so now let's just do uh, some quick examples about operators for various types. Uh, we're going to uh, the class and let's call them, uh, actually let's call them booleans just to show that we can do that without having any conflict with our previous booleans class because it is in another package. Um, and so, in this um, in this one, we are just going to uh, look a little bit at a bunch of operators and a, a bit at the random class. Um, so let's say we have two booleans, boolean A, and let's say this is true, and oops, as we've done before, and another one, oh, one, um, boolean B equals to false, we'll be using later than. Um, what, what we can also do is to assign a random a random logical value to, this, to these variables by using uh, our random class. So let's, let's um, declare and initialize our random. Now, um, as you can see, IntelliJ was very smart. I didn't import this. So as I clicked on it, uh, IntelliJ imported it. Um, now it's red, you see? And so that, will, that window will pop up, and you can actually also just do import class. So that will, that will have uh, the same effect, uh, because the definition of that class is, is not in this source file. So we need to include it. That's what that is doing. We can call it, uh, let's say, k is, and then use um, this, um, actually, let's call it um, r for random. And then we can initialize it without using um, any of the seeds. And then what we are going to do is to use those two uh, variables uh, to store some random uh, um, uh, booleans. A equals r uh, dot next boolean. So that will give us a random boolean and b equals r dot next boolean. Now if I print them out, A south b, Let's see what happens here. Um, so now it's true and false, but we this, these are randomly assigned, right? So if I run it again, uh, oh, it's doing the same thing, unfortunately, um, which can happen. Oh, that's a very strange thing. Maybe I'm, I did something wrong. I don't think so. Yes, that was just... Uh, uh, bad luck, <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, so they will change, of course, because they're random, and the point is they will change in an in independent fashion. However, if I create another, uh, let's say, random object here, and I give it the seed, let's call it R zero, and I give it the seed the zero here. And then I will assign them as I did before and print them. Except that now I'm assigning them by using R0. 
this is just to show you the, uh, the fact that we are using pseudo uh, random numbers. Um, so that is another one of the examples that I didn't really want to have. Right. So you can see that the first two, of course, they're random. They can, they can by chance be the same value for true or false. Uh, but in general, they are not tied to be the same. While since I'm using the same seed for the second two values, they're always going to be the same. Okay, uh, quickly, a little bit of double operators. Um, new Java class. Doubles. Um, there are a few interesting things to, to be said here, although I will go pretty quickly. Um, so we, we saw before that uh, we can assign a double also with uh, our scientific notation. Um, we can generate random doubles as well. So random, let's use this um, R to generate a, a, an object, to create an object which is a random generator. And then um, the way we can generate random doubles uh, is just uh, through a method uh, of random, right? So I can use r dot um, next double, and it's smart enough to suggest that that should be the function, and that will generate some 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 uh, random doubles. Um, some other interesting things uh, about um, doubles, I guess. Um, I mean, we have seen that um, uh, we can do um, additions, for example. So let's let's actually do this. And the operator precedence. Um, so let's say I want to add two doubles. Um, and I can use literals in there. Um, and what happens if I do this? Um, let's run it. So, so what is going on there? Anybody? What's the problem here? Sorry? Yes, it is, it, is, it is interpreting those as strings and then is doing a string concatenation. And that's because of the operator precedence rules. Um, so in order to get the right result there, I need to override the operator precedence and I need to do uh, this. So how do we override it? Use parentheses. Then what happens is that, oops, uh, what happens there now is that the, um, the, 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 the expression in parentheses is evaluated first, and the result is uh, converted into a string and then concatenated with the other string and printed out. Right, and let's run this. I just want to do the last uh, one uh, for integers, to be fair just to show a bunch of functionalities, then I might, I might add this, a short video to explore all these things and that you can watch uh, 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 at home uh, if necessary. Um, one thing that I, the, the one important thing that I wanted to show about uh, the integers is the uh, um, increment operators. Right, so let's do that. Let's start add our last class. Do in the first. Name. We know already a lot of stuff about integers from our previous team. There are just a bunch of functions that I want to show you. Uh, one is uh, this function that shows you 
what is the maximum integer that is representable in that representation, okay? What's the maximum value that an integer can have on, on your machine? And so that is a value that you can access uh, through the integer class here. Oops. Ah. This one, not the first one. Uh, and it's called max value. Right, and so you can get that uh, and print that out. Uh, something weird is happening. Oh yes, I have a comma there. Uh, and the same for the minimum one. I will print everything out at the end. Uh, that's called the just the min value. So if you're curious, and this ca this can be used right because especially if you're doing um, dealing with codes that need to use um, a, a very large integer, you need to know about um, what is your rep representation upper bound, of course. Um, another thing that I want to show you is that there is a special way for converting among types at runtime. Um, and so this is also known as casting. So Java uses a conversion between types that, 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 that uses the, the, um, the convention for, of C casting. I will show one example of this. It's not a totally, well, I guess, um, again, it, it mimics really what, what um, C does. So if I want to have, if I have an integer, um, well, I don't need to declare it even. Convert to um, um, double, for example, and you know I can input, let's say, the number five here. This is for concatenation, and then what I can do is to put in parentheses the type I want to convert to. Of course, not all kind of conversions are safe or or or, or allowed uh, but that what that will do is to convert that five which is a literal for for an integer into a double and I didn't need the plus here and finally just two things that I want to show you before we leave for today is uh, your um, binary plus and uh, uh, um, uh, operators and your uh, increment and decrement operators for integers. They are quite helpful and they are part of uh, the syntax of control flow statements, typically. So, um, for example, let's declare an integer. Uh, if I haven't done so, yes. And let's say this is zero. Uh, and I can print that out. And let's say the value of i is. And then what I can do is to just write plus plus i. Right? That's what I, what I said before. This, this, this is an expression statement. It's a special one. It's a very concise one. Um, and if you use that, that will increase the value of, of i, right? And once, once um, as you can see, and then once i is 1, I could also do minus minus i, for example, and then print it out, and that will decrement i by uh, one unit. And um, the last two examples are, I could also say i plus equal, and let's make it 2 so that you know, it's not equivalent to the first one because I can increment it by a factor of two here. Um, and that's instead using the binary um, combined plus SQL operator uh, for those. All right, that's uh, any questions on this so far?
I cannot see any hands uh, raised. Okay, in that case, um, I think uh, we are over time already um, of a, a few minutes. Um, and so I will close the lecture here and I will talk about our next biography at the beginning of, of the next lecture. See you next time and have a good weekend. Yes. Um, Do you mind just giving me